Welcome everyone to the third episode of CSI Skill Tree. Uh, in this series, we take a close look at video games to examine and celebrate the work they do in envisioning the future and building rich, thought-provoking worlds. My name is Joey Eshrick at the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, and I'll be your host today. So in the first two episodes of this series, we've talked about specific games, but today we're gonna tackle a whole knot of issues around how games orchestrate time and emotion. As video games have matured as a medium and as the people who are creating the games have gotten older and the industry has grown, there've been a, a whole variety of attempts to build legitimacy for games as art, as a creatively and culturally legitimate medium. So for example, you'll see pieces about games in the New Yorker and the Atlantic, You'll see studios hiring top fiction writers to write their games. And there's a newfound enthusiasm for the voice actors who bring characters to life. And one thing you see in a lot of these efforts is likening games to movies, praising games as having cinema quality stories or delivering the same narrative punch as a feature film. And recently we saw this uh, very clearly with The Last of Us 2, a game about the costs of violence set in a bleak, a bleak post-apocalyptic world. But we could ask, does this conversation even serve games well, judging them by cinematic standards, or should we be looking in different directions if we want to understand what makes games compelling and engaging? So today we're going to use this sort of troubled comparison of games and movies as a starting point, and then consider three examples that throw into stark relief things that games handle uniquely compared to movies and to other media, and that's managing our sense of time and evoking our emotions. And I'm honored to be joined today by Tochi Onyabuchi and Jessica L. Condit. Tochi, Jessica, thank you so much for being here. A pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for having me. So I'll briefly introduce each of you. Uh, Tochi is the author of Beast Made of Night, its sequel, Crown of Thunder, War Girls, and his adult fiction debut, Riot Baby. His latest novel is titled Rebel, Rebel Sisters, and it comes out this November. And he is the winner of the Lube Noma Award for Best Speculative Fiction Novel by an African. Jessica L. Condit is a senior editor at Engadget, where she covers video games and strives to tell human stories within the broader tech industry. And she's also a novelist, and she's currently working on her second near future sci-fi adjacent book. So we'll start here uh, by talking about the cynic cinematic aspirations of games and what makes them unique as a creative medium. And then we'll look, uh, as I said, at three specific titles, uh, Death Stranding, Flower, and Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. And we'll kind of unpack what they can teach us about time, emotion, and narrative. And then we'll turn to responding to your questions and comments. So uh, to that end, throughout the conversation, anytime, and please not just at the very end of our time here, uh, please use the little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit a question or a comment for us. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, get underway and dive into it. So Tochi and Jess, I, I wanted to just start with this question that I opened up in my introduction, which is, are, are movies the standard by which games should be judged? And are there aspects of that comparison that really work and, and, and are illuminating? And are there aspects that maybe don't fit as well? Uh, I think, you know, they, they, it is the sort of point of comparison, but it shouldn't necessarily be. Um, and I think also too, it speaks to the diversity of genre. Um, of video games and different aims that they may have. You know, I, I play Tony Hawk Pro Skater for different reasons than I play Red Dead Redemption. Um, and I feel that gaming as a, a genre of entertainment is almost too expansive for the movie comparison because I think ultimately and fundamentally they're, you know, they're, they're two different types of experiences. It sounds sort of, you know, obvious to, to put it that way, but it seems as though they're aimed at engaging the consumer in fundamentally different ways. Yeah, I agree that the, the framework of cinema is limiting for video games. I mean, they're, they're inherently different. There's a reason we have both, you know, both things. They're very different things. Video games offer, I think, if we wanna, if we wanna talk about it in terms of film, an extra layer, you know, if there's, if there's film and then there's games offer something more, there's, there are different considerations to take into account when the audience literally has control over how the story unfolds, what actions are taken, what's actually on screen, all these things. Um, and not only that, the mechanics themselves can tell a story. And that's something that you, you can play with a little bit with audience interaction in film, but it, aside from like just talking directly to the camera or breaking the fourth wall that way, 
there's not really any interaction you're going to get any feedback from the from the player from the audience member so video games i mean they're just inherently there's a different standard there's so much more to i think unpack and enjoy there um and and i think it makes sense that we've kind of defaulted to film as this this baseline for success or for for the bar of art in film or in video games um, because it's it's a visual medium it's it's this blockbuster entertainment thing it's exactly what video games want to be uh, and and where they are uh, so they share the same space but they're inherently different beasts it's kind of ironic because, you know, you see these kind of crossover efforts when you see games kind of marketed to a presumably non-gaming audience, uh, you see the cinema comparison crop up quite a bit. And in the big crossover games, you'll more often see Hollywood actors. A number of years ago, Kevin Spacey was in, was in like a shooter game, you know. Um, but the games industry is much bigger than the film industry globally. And, and so I, I think that's like a, a kind of a strange, it's one of the things that drew me to this you know, hook for the event in the first place is like, you know, it seems perverse that this like much larger industry would be looking to this to this smaller industry for for legitimacy in a way. Yeah, no, I think it's it's Oh, no, Jess, after you. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense. I'll be quick. It, it makes sense, mm -hmm. I think, because uh, I mean, video games use a little more technology than than movies. No, we figured out the tech for movies first and video games are just there. It's it's an extrapolation. It's just exponentially growing. Um, and, and yeah, so, so she, you know, take it from there. <laughs> I think it's also a sort of there's money in the banana stand type of situation going on where, uh, you know, it, it almost brings to mind the, the comparison of uh, pop music with other sort of less, uh, you know, popular uh, forms of music or more niche forms of music where you know, it seems as though oftentimes you may come across pop artists or pop aspirational artists who, you know, believe that there is a sort of legitimacy in being more niche. Um, and you will see sort of vice versa trends, you know, going pop or becoming a popular artist, you know, is often seen as selling out. Pop is this sort of large umbrella. That's where all the money is. And I feel like with games, there's, you know, I... I wonder if there's also a sort of, you know, uh, latent envy at how much, just like how popular and how, how sort of almost intrusive games are to modern living. I mean, you look at how much money Fortnite made when it first came out and, you know, the, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Everywhere's, every, everybody's kids, everybody's kids were playing Fortnite, you know, over like, and, and, it just, you look at the, you know, for instance, the, the revenue totals for like a Call of Duty game in the first 24 hours, and it will sometimes like eclipse the entire domestic box office total of like, you know, the average, the average movie that's released. And so I think there's also, you know, in addition to the mechanics aspect, I think there's also, they occupy two different spaces in American entertainment and in, I think, entertainment globally. Yeah. And if I, it, just a little, um, little sidebar. So like video games are, are kind of following a path that film laid out even within like academia. Film was not taken, you know, seriously within academic circles until like, I mean, maybe the seventies, the eighties, this is when like, when universities started, you know, accepting film courses into into their programs and stuff like that. And this is, and films were trying to emulate, you know, literature at that point. It was like literature is the bar for this is art and this is serious art. And then film was coming and saying, no, we're just as serious. And it took a long time for film mm -hmm. to be recognized in that way. And I see video games doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing universities now pick up, you know, video game classes and not just programming, but really looking at the cultural impact of video games. Um, so, so they're not so different in that aspect. Um, and I think we can learn something from, from film and apply it to video games. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up uh, just because there's this book that I read when, it, when I was an, an undergraduate student at Arizona State University and it's called Film as Art. It's a book by Rudolf Arnheim, a film scholar. And it was published, uh, I think, as a collection in the 50s by the University of California Press. But Arnheim was writing these essays in the 30s trying to say like, film is art. It's not like this trivial or kind of grubby entertainment. You know, film was trying to shake off its vaudevillian roots. 
um, you know, in this sort of like working class entertainment sphere. And, you know, it took then, as you said, decades after the publication of this big academic book in the 50s for this to really percolate into like university curricula and get serious. So, yeah, I do think the seeing the trajectories of these media as they're, as they're first seen as kind of disreputable and trivial and then eventually seen in, in a high art context is really interesting. And I wonder how much of that is the audience, like if it's just kids or if it's just young people or if it's just women or any of those factors, yeah. I mean, you can kind of downplay it in the in the larger society. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to try to strike a different comparison and to build on something that Tochi just said, it perhaps is, is playing a game maybe a little bit more like putting on a record than watching a movie. This is something we talked to death as we were kind of preparing for and getting our head around this event. Yeah, no, it definitely, it feels like, you know, choosing to be in different moods, you know, it's it in the way that like, oh, I feel like listening to, you know, the Deftones today, or I feel like, you know, listening to Styles P or, you know what, I think I'm in the mood for some Aaliyah right now. It very much feels like, you know, when I put on a game, in part because of time investment, you know, I listen to an album, I, you know, that's not a two hour commitment. It's not a 90 minute commitment. You know, I put on a game, um, you know, that that's not necessarily, you know, especially if I don't intend on beating the whole thing in one go, you know, that's not necessarily a, a two hour commitment, or at least it's not one that I'm conscious of engaging in if I really reach that flow state. And so it does feel as though I, I have more I can be freer with it. And in many ways, it, you know, that's a particular mindset that I'm choosing to be in or a mind space that I'm choosing to engage in, as opposed to a movie where, you know, I guess, you know, to put it, you know, rather intensely, it can almost feel as though you're being held hostage, you know, by the, by the item that, you know, it could be an experience that you're choosing to have, but it's, it's, it's a, I guess, in terms of chunks of time, it feels more, solid and more sort of higher stakes than say, for instance, you know, if I want to play a game of Madden, for instance. Yeah, and there's these different like kind of chunks by game, right? Like, as you were saying, there's all of these different dosing. And I know when we're deciding around this house, what, you know, what game to play, we're like, do we have enough time to really like get to anything interesting in this game? And there's all of these different like kind of points uh, of like, oh, we're gonna, we can play Mario for 10 minutes, but we can't play, you know, this giant like epic PS4 game for, for 10 minutes because we won't get to any of the good stuff. Um, so there's all of this like time budgeting that we, that we feel like we have to do maybe. Um, and that's maybe a little bit less like music. But the other thing you said in terms of like the emotional state that you want to evoke and the mood that you're in, to me that, that was a, an attractive comparison to music. Jess, I wonder what you make of all of this. Yeah, I mean, a video game is a vibe just like a record is. <laughs> I feel that, yeah. Um, like it's I, 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 maybe it's part of it is because there's often a really good soundtrack in a lot of video games. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, because you're putting it on and you're just filling, if you're doing it right, I think you're filling your house or your headphones or your apartment with this, this world. You're really immersing yourself in it. Um, and in that way, it really, it, it can change. Yeah, the whole mood. It's, a, it's an experience. It's a treat more than like just putting on a movie and looking at your phone the whole time. Um, I mean, that said, I also put on video games and then put a podcast on in the background. And like, that's my vibe. It's extra chill. Um, and that's, that's it. But that's a different time commitment. Each of these scenarios, there's, yeah. you can pick and choose really well. Yeah. I remember years ago on Slate.com's like Culture Gab Fest podcast, uh, one of their political correspondents, Jamel Bowie, who's now at the New York Times, was talking about the only way that he ever watches movies is that he watches like 20 minutes of them <laughs> in the morning. And then he would go to write, you know, and, and go to work. And <laughs> he spent like 10 minutes fending off the other hosts and they were like apostasy. Like you can't do that to a movie. You know, you can't, you can do that to a TV show. You can do it to a podcast, but you can't chunk a movie up like that. There's something uh, to uh, hark on a word that I've harp on a word I've kept using here, disreputable. It's like bad in some way. It's violent to the movie. I don't think we feel that way with games. And it's maybe because there's such a diversity of formats and kind of the loops of games are at different lengths. Like you might, want to level up or you want to finish a single fight or you want to finish a game of Madden. Uh, you know, and then of course, if you're on public transit, you see people playing Candy Crush, right? It's like the game that you can pick up and put down every 20 seconds. Um, so I think that that is significant. The like that there are these cultural norms around consumption that are 
either really concrete or really elastic, depending on the medium. And that's, I think that's shifting with games and mobile, the growth of the mobile market within video games. It's just everyone has a, a device capable of playing basically any game they, they would want to. They have it in their pocket generally. Like that's, that's where we're getting to. Um, and that's, it's the, it's the fastest growing segment within gaming, mobile. Yeah. Um, and that, there's a good reason for that, yeah. Yeah, and I wonder, that, that makes me wonder too, if part of the sort of, I guess you could say the, the cultural reception of games versus other forms of entertainment is that it, you know, th you know, you think of say for instance, something like, you know, theater or opera, and that's like a three hour commitment, you know, even, even longer it can be. And it's viewed as this sort of, you know, the, the height of culture because you're sitting down and for three to five hours or however many hours, you're committed to this single spectacle. You can't like, you, you have like maybe one break two hours in to even go to the bathroom or like go to the bar. Um, and that's the investment. Like you have to, you have to afford to, to be able to take the time and energy to invest in this spectacle versus something like Candy Crush. You can be on the subway and you know, if you're two stops away, you can get in a game of Candy Crush. Uh, and I feel like that's part of it too, is we feel where there's this perception in culture that you know, something has to, you know, if not hurt, then at least take something out of you to be a proper piece of culture. And if it doesn't do that, then it's just, you know, it's, it's entertainment. Yeah, I really like, see, and that, that draws me back to another reason that I'm attracted to this music comparison, just as a sort of like thought experiment, because it is like, I think we all, the way we listen to music now, especially, is that it, it fills all the little interstices in your day. You've got a dead couple minutes and maybe I should be able to be alone with myself in, in silence, but I can't. And so I'm sort of filling it with music. And that music is often a kind of mood, you know, stabilizer in the same way that I think uh, we've all talked at, at various moments about, about games doing that of like, filling in these, these lengths of time and, and that there's a, a sort of selection process that, um, you know, is about the metabolism of your day. And I think, as you said, Tochi, like movies and then some of these more like high art forms need to kind of be like carved out of your schedule and, and require, um, you know, a much larger commitment of time. And I, I wonder if that's like, you know, it's, it is harder for me to jump into like a TV show or a, or a, um, a movie in chunks like that, it's it's harder for me because it's it's just, it's all about the story, right? Like you really want to focus and pay attention, and I want to follow these story beats, unless it's reality TV, which I do watch a lot of, and I love, and I can put on in the background, not care about. Yeah. But um, but yeah, and then with a the game, maybe it's just more about the mechanic itself. So you don't, it's the narrative that you're spinning is already it's it's right here and it's already here, and you, it you, you're not really following that thread, uh, makes it easier to chunk up, yeah. Yeah, so that gets me to my to my next question before we kind of dive into to looking specifically at a few examples, which is, you know, what is it that we lose sight of when we are like relying on a cinema metaphor or some other kind of like other medium to kind of parse games for, for ourselves and for other people? Like, what are some qualities that are unique to gaming as a medium? Um, and we've already kind of talked around some of them in some ways, but like, are there ones that we really want to like articulate that are easy to ignore or miss when you're describing a game to someone or having to write about it or analyze it, um, but that are really essential to the experience? I think more nowadays, the social experience that games offer, mm -hmm. the online, the, the, the cooperative and the competitive aspects of games. I mean, that's completely unique and it's something it's something that this medium uh, can provide. And that's a, one of the reasons uh, gaming and Twitch viewership has just gone pretty off the charts uh, during the pandemic. You know, this mm -hmm. is a social uh, experience for a lot of people. So that's, that's a huge one for me. Yeah, no, and I think sort of, you know, dovetailing off of that, the, the way that interactivity sort of demands a sort of complicity from the consumer uh, in, you know, perhaps the most extreme way, you know, you could, you could watch a movie and if you're rooting for a particular character, you can feel this sort of residual complicity in the choices that they make. But in a game, you're the one pushing the button. You know, it's sort of like press X to kill this person and you're actually pressing X, you know, it's like, you know, hold Y to pay respects. And like, it's <laughs> demanding, you know, this thing of you, otherwise you can't progress in the game. You can't move forward in, in the story or in the rest of the game. 
until you do this thing. And I think that, you know, it, you're in it, you're in it. There's not really the same level of distance that you would have if you were watching something or reading a book or, or, or even, you know, listening to me, like music, you would sort of be in it, but you're not making any particular choices within the actual piece of art. Whereas with a video game, you are an essential piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, when I, when I, I read a lot of, uh, and especially since we've started this series, but a lot of games criticism and, and analysis, it's one of the things I love most about like the culture around games. Um, and I do think there is still, even as like the uh, kind of, I don't know, the art and science of games analysis, like, you know, grows and gets more complex and more participatory, people still really often want to talk about themes and they really want to talk about narrative. Like I think is it's, that's what we're attuned to do when we're learning how to analyze media and talk about it. Those are the languages that we're used to. And, and so things like feelings of mastery and progression and uh, uh, Tochi, I think it was you who said a flow state, you know, that idea of like kind of losing yourself and being in the zone um, are, are things that I think are harder to write about and get across. And that's, that's exactly why I wanted to have this conversation with the two of you to get at things like the, the affective dimensions and like those, those feelings that are just trickier to write about. And they're tricky to write about when you're writing about a film, but I think it's even harder with a game because each player is, as we've talked about, controlling their own pace and like digesting the game in different sizes of, you know, chunks. Um, so yeah, I think. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting, like Twitch is a perfect example of that. Like you, you can watch someone making these choices and it's, you can watch different people play the same game and you're going to have a different experience every time, yeah. just the same way that when you play the game, it feels different. You, I mean, there's no like Twitch for movies, I guess, Netflix, you could watch with your friends, but like you're not watching someone else watch a movie and like, yeah. I don't know, but watching someone play a game, it feels completely natural. And it totally is. That's how I grew up with games. I had an older brother. I wasn't allowed to play Doom. He was, you know, <laughs> and that was my first experience with Doom, but like, I love it. And I love that Twitch is such a thing, but it, I think it gets to the heart of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like that, like that brings to mind these very fond memories I have of playing Smash Brothers with my cousins. And, you know, it's past the sticks and you're, you move, you migrate from observer to participant, you know, and like your experience, even after having watched the last person, you know, you know, play the game, perform their moves, you know, you've seen their strategies and whatnot, like, it's a whole different game when you're playing, you know, you're not guaranteed, you know, given the information that you've accumulated, you're not guaranteed victory, um, as was demonstrated to me uh, quite a bit <laughs> during that period <laughs> of my life. I really love that idea of like the, almost the, 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 not only that oscillation of roles, but also like that people are, are have different styles of playing the same game. And, and I, I, yeah, I really feel that. I think that's a, a great point and something that's really hard to find an, uh, an analogy for, I think, in other media, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, so with that, I, I think maybe we'll, we'll shift to our examples. So we're going we're gonna to talk about um, a bunch of the stuff we've been talking about and try to focus a little bit on this like sort of emotion and time dynamic in three games that manage these qualities very differently. So we tried to pick three uh, examples that craft these unique experiences of play that are that are really diverse, but uh, share not being very collapsible into um, just a story or just the metaphor of like an interactive movie. Um, and each of us will take the lead on one example. And uh, in, in, in each case, we'll show you a brief minute or two of gameplay from each game, uh, just so you can give us a sense of what, uh, so we can give you a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, so Jess, if your uh, game, you can lead us uh, uh, on our first example, which is Death Stranding. Sure thing. All right. Um, so Death Stranding, this is a late 2019 game. This is from Hideo Kojima. And uh, this is the dude that was responsible for the Metal Gear series. I mean, he literally created a genre of games, helped create a genre of games, a stealth genre, um, and, and has uh, really kept the weirdness going throughout his career. Um, and Death Stranding was his latest, uh, was his latest work. And it was, it was a very uh, big production, big deal. Um, and it's very cinematic. Um, this is this is something we'll talk about a bit, but why don't we we get a look at it? This is a a futuristic 
um, a futuristic world and Sam Porter Bridges is the, the main character, played by Norman Reedus, you'll notice. And uh, he, he's making deliveries across a wasteland um, filled with secrets and uh, some competitive things. So yeah, if you want to play a little bit of the clip and we'll take a look. And with it, a host of theories advanced by physicians and psychologists desperate to explain the world's newest mystery. The symptoms were duly categorized and stratified in levels. But repatriates like you are a singularly rare breed, worthy of a classification all your own. Hmm. I, what I find uh, pretty interesting there, like just, just off the bat, was how well you were walking around. I wasn't playing that clip, but like the, the hardest part of this game, and, and it's meant to be the hardest part, is the, well, I think it is, is the actual walking. When you're carrying packs and packs of things and you have, you have stacks of, of deliveries on your back, it is so hard to stay upright with that character, and, and that's, that's the point. You're going to damage your stuff if you fall, and it's just, it's a mechanic made to basically force you to slow down. It's made to, to drive home that walking is the game. And hey, guess what? That's what we do in, in most games, and especially AAA games, a lot of your time is spent walking. Um, and hey, that's fine. I think that, that kind of gets to the heart of like, yeah, it's a game. This is, this is great. Um, but one thing that I that I see there, like what gets me excited about that game is seeing all the bits that have been left by other players and like scanning the environment and then finding someone else's ladder or, or something. Like this game allows you to asynchronously play with other people. Um, there, there's, there are little multiplayer aspects and this is the whole strand theory within the game, death stranding, you're forming connections with people. Um, and, and that, is, is the exciting part of this game. Um, what we didn't see there is the, I mean, 50 hours of cutscenes <laughs> that, are, that are in this game. Um, and that's, that's where I want to talk about like the, how the film aspect is, is a bit overbearing, I think, and maybe even holding uh, Kojima back. Uh, he's such a weird dude. Maybe he could be even weirder uh, if, he weren't, if he weren't trapped by this, but I don't, I don't know where we want to take it from here necessarily. Well, I'll just say on the, to build on your point about the, the cinematic, you know, cutscenes and stuff. Yeah, the game is a profusion of cutscenes that feature celebrity cameos. Delightfully, Mads Mikkelsen is in the game and, and uh, Guillermo del Toro, the director, uh, among others. And uh, those, those are both very complex and filled with inscrutable lore. But on the other hand, the plot of that part of the game is actually somewhat straightforward and, and kind of tropey and generic in certain ways. 
Whereas the gameplay experience, as you said, is such a subtle tweak on how a game with a big geography, a big open world to traverse uh, works because it's, 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 it's very laborious to get around. Uh, I was playing and as you can see, I was like, I got stuck up a mountain and I had gone the wrong way. I had to, I had to use one of my hard one ladders to get down the mountain, you know? Um, and it, uh, the things you're carrying actually weigh something, which is like atypical for a game like this. Usually you're carrying 300 pounds of like clubs and swords and herbs and like you don't, yeah, your character's sprinting at top speed for an hour at a time, it's fine. And in this game, the, 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 the introduction of balance mechanics and the, the sort of physical feeling of the weight is really significant. And, and the fact that the game is kind of about tedium. It's sort of a game about, it's a game that is not afraid to kind of bore you at times and for you to like try to find the fun or the emotional recompense in that boredom. And that's why I think it's really interesting about it. And yeah, it's best to get away from the cutscenes as much as you can, I think, to kind of see what's fresh and new about the game. Right, and I, I just honestly feel like that this game, yeah, I'll say just, we'll focus on Death Stranding. Death Stranding focus, or it, it relies on cutscenes to, to drive the narrative uh, in a way that just feels so jarring to me. And it's not what I want. Literally playing, playing a lot of Kojima's games, you put the controller down and you just sit and you're watching. It's like you're watching a movie, which, hey, that's fine. The story is, is weird and, and, and good enough. And, you know, it's engaging and the acting is, is going to be great because they're, literally a-list actors um but yeah i just he's clearly interested in video games themselves he talked about death stranding kojima talked about death stranding as a new genre of games just like metal gear was a, a new genre the stealth genre strand games were supposed to be this new thing um and yeah, i think he like copyrighted it and all that you know he went all out so like he's thinking obviously he's very much thinking about video games and these mechanics but it feels like there was an idea there and it just got smothered by the cutscenes and the, the the focus on cinema and the focus on this 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 film framework that he really wanted to get through um and that strand concept could have been even more like just the way that the landscape itself feels barren when you're walking around i it feels like that that mechanic itself felt a little barren. There's like, it was the beginning of an idea. And if maybe if he could have focused on that a little more and let that tell the story, truly tell the story. It, I mean, it would have been a different game, um, but I think it could have been just so much more of what a video game can be rather than what a film can be. Yeah, it's kind of an experiment, like w when it's working and it's really chugging along, I think it is, it is what we were talking about earlier. It's, it's the mechanics telling a story because you're, you're uh, especially when you're not on like a main quest where you're moving the story forward, you'll sometimes have opportunities to just make kind of like generic deliveries of like food or like a, a machine part or something to like a colony that's in need. And, you know, you'll get your several hundred pounds of gear on, on poor Norman Reedus's back and you'll, you know, you'll traverse this, this wasteland. You'll try to get across a river or up a hill and it's often harder than it seems like it should be. And what I think is being stressed there is like the hard work of connecting people, the hard work of like logistics and getting far flung human beings to have their needs met and to, you know, get, um, to get resources from one another and to kind of like, you know, it's like, and, and we see this now, I mean, this game's become really resonant, I think, in the pandemic, because it's like, you know, Norman Reedus is kind of an essential worker in this game. Sam Porter Bridges, this character, is, you know, the only people you see outside of cities and bunkers are these, um, are, are, are either brigands or these, uh, these delivery people who are mm -hmm. going from place to place and doing the hard work of just like getting basic supplies to people. And that's really compelling. And it sort of doesn't, it always feels to me like when I'm playing it and I'm really enjoying it, that it doesn't need the superstructure of the story. It doesn't need that imposed upon. Um, and, and my friend, uh, Liz Fiacco, who's a game developer and was a previous guest in this series, said that she hopes that somebody takes the you know, basic idea of this game and makes a mountain climbing game out of it, where you're like yes. lugging all your gear up, up you know, Everest or something, and that that would be really compelling. And you wouldn't need the story because we all kind of see climbing a mountain as a story in, in and of itself, and it, it would have its own narrative progression. I think that's such a brilliant tweak. I was like, well, you should quickly trademark that and do it. <laughs> oh, exactly. And that's where like, I love indie developers because they don't have the access to AAA, you know, development budgets. They don't have the access to Mads Mikkelsen. So they're just making games, <laughs> you 
usually a lot of the time that's where they're starting and like so they're thinking about mechanics very very literally very distinctly and i i love the independent development scene uh, just for that yeah absolutely yeah uh tochi any parting thoughts before we go on to the next example yeah no it's 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 interesting particularly with the kojima uh genre of games is that you know, there, you know, if you go on YouTube, there will be supercuts of all the cinema scenes and you can just watch it as a movie. And one thing that I, that sort of happened to me over the course of playing Kojima games is that at a certain point, I stopped, I stopped grokking the cut scenes as aspects of cinema and looked at them instead as signals of an impending boss fight. Um, <laughs> like that's what they felt, that's what it felt like. It was like, you know, Oh, I just triggered a cutscene. Oh, no, I'm going to have to fight this character. <laughs> it's like finding a room full of ammo and health. Yeah, you yeah, exactly. Coming. You know, you stumble upon this wide open space and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> this feeling of dread sinks in. And so it's funny because I think, you know, my impression is that it's somewhat uh, unintentional, that byproduct where it's like, okay, you're, you, you intend to evoke in the the player or you know at this point the viewer the sense of awe at the at the you know production value and oh that's Mads Mikkelsen and etc cetera, etc cetera, when really I just feel dread like this impending dread because I'm like okay okay I I, I don't know what to do I've never seen this boss before <laughs> yeah. what am I going to do and so I think that's an interesting way in which you know, the whole, the whole experience of gaming, the aspect of gaming kind of co-ops other, other artistic elements that, you know, try to infiltrate it. You know, cinema doesn't necessarily have to exist as cinema in a game. It can be a signal, you know, cutscene as signal as opposed to cutscene as something that you view in and of itself. And that I find particularly compelling in the fabric of Kojima games because they're very clearly signaling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder about the future of cutscenes with the next generation. I mean, if we're we're cutting down load times, and maybe we're not going to need some of these long scenes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I wonder. I just wonder how that's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think I will dive into our second case study, which I, I think will be a little bit of a shorter conversation. We'll use it as a bumper between these other two. But um, I want to remind everybody to jump into Q and A uh, and. Uh, jot a question or comment for Tochi and Jessica and I, and we would love to hear from you and looking forward to that part of the conversation too. So the second game we're gonna talk about, uh, very different than Death Stranding and extremely different than our third example is Flower. Uh, Flower uh, came out in 2009 and it was developed by That Game Company, which is a studio that was founded by two uh, uh, students from the University of Southern California. And in Flower, the player collects and kind of blows around sort of as the wind an ever-growing cloud of flower petals. And so you're sort of moving your controller, if you're playing on PlayStation, which is what it came out for first, you're moving your PlayStation controller around the motion controls are kind of the way that you summon the wind and send it in different directions. And I think of it as kind of a love letter to the calm and tranquility of being in nature. It's a biophilia game. And at its best, it tends to put you in kind of a bliss out flow state, as we've been talking about. So uh, let's look at a quick clip of flower.
So for me, this is um, a game that's really about ambiance. It's about immersion. It's about uh, setting an emotional tone. Um, and going back to our music metaphor, uh, Lewis Gordon, uh, a games writer writing for The Outline in 2018, called Flower, um, among other titles, an ambient game. Uh, and, and you know he was observing that it shares characteristics with ambient music of lightening our mood, offering a space for reflection, and giving kind of techno urban dwellers an escape from the uh, steel and concrete of our of our everyday grind. Uh, and so when the developers of this game, it's actually an interesting story, found out like they play tested the game, and some of their play testers said like, oh, this game's all about clean energy. Later on, you end up navigating around a bunch of wind turbines. Uh, they actually pared back those elements and kind of couched them a little more because they were so insistent about not wanting the game to be reducible to a storyline or a fable. Uh, they, they wanted it to remain this kind of undefined experience. Uh, have either of you played this game much? Mm -hmm. Back in the day. PlayStation. Yeah, it's, this is an older <laughs> one. This is like, uh, yeah. I guess it's 10 years old now. Um, <laughs> wow, it doesn't feel that old though. Jeez, all right. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there's less to say about this in a way. I think it kind of speaks for itself. I think, you know, uh, I've noticed that there's more and more indie games, especially with environmental themes, and uh, they tend to center process and flow in this way, they tend to avoid linear storytelling, looking for cycles. This game is linear, but it's, it's sort of subtly linear. It's really good at guiding you from place to place. It's, it's impossible to fail at this game. You can't screw up. Uh, that was me again playing, and I'm really bad at moving my PS4 controller around. So you can be kind of herky-jerky, uh, and that's not very pleasant. Um, it takes a little time to get used to if you're not doing those kinds of movements very much. But uh, it's got lovely music, and you're kind of, it gives you the feeling that you're creating the score. So again, it really involves you, it implicates you, like Toshi was saying earlier. Um, and I think this gets to like a thing that some games want to do, which is that they want to, we talked about it with Death Stranding, which has these really beautiful landscapes, actually. Um, makes you feel like you're out for a hike uh, somewhere very remote. But, you know, here it's like you're getting that sense of the sublime, the uh, being awestruck by nature and natural processes. And, you know, they're, they're portrayed fancifully here, these flowers, you know, bursting and shooting green all over the landscape. But um, I don't know, it, it is definitely, it, it is one of those games that you can play for a few minutes and feel like you got something out of it because it is, uh, it, it does feel very much to me like like listening to a song with your eyes closed kind of thing. But, um, and it's maybe similar to, for those of you who have played it, the Tetris Effect, uh, mm -hmm. which is, or Tetris Effect, which is a, another PlayStation 4 game, um, which tries to create this like kind of overwhelming, uh, beautifully orchestrated sort of, music and color show along with your along with your your tetris and you know that game's very slightly harder than flower but i think that you can um you can still and just set it on easy and really just enjoy like moving around the blocks and hearing the great music mm -hmm. one thing that i found very uniquely interesting about flower was the way that the rewards mechanism you know sort of kicked in with that game which is that you know as you hit these flowers you collect petals and so you know, already it looks very aesthetically pleasing or your, your character, quote unquote, looks very aesthetically pleasing. The more petals you collect, the, the grander this sort of, this, this spiral of flora becomes that you're guiding. And it'd be like, it's gorgeous to watch. And it's like, okay, I have incentive to touch all these flowers now and collect their petals because it's sort of like, I get to preen. And I like, it just looks, <laughs> Very, very, like even just watching that clip and, and seeing you collect these petals and sort of grow, um, I felt better. Like I just, yeah. I just, like I'm pretty sure my blood pressure lowered quite yeah, a bit. Same. <laughs> I could watch that. I could watch you playing that game. Even you weren't playing that bad. It was great. <laughs> I could watch that all day. Like yeah, absolutely. And it's it's interesting. Like that era of indie games. Almost. Um, I'm thinking. When I think of games that like really use mechanics in a way that like move the story in a special way, I think of like Fez and, yeah. um, and even Braid because like you can kind of control time and all, the, all these things. It's the way that you move is the game. You can, you can move the world around you or you can, you can really literally create the world around you. It's, and I think there's something in that because Flower 
I mean, has no right being as popular as it is, right? But mm -hmm. there's some magic that, that that's a good developer. There's magic in it where you are immediately in, you're immediately, the controls make sense for the world and you know what to do and you just, you, you're there. And that's the magic of, of a game. It doesn't have to be this, this grand storyline with, with a rounding soundtrack. It just, sometimes you just need a flower. Yeah, and that's, I think that's really powerful and really cool. All right, I think we should uh, move along for time reasons and get to like the polar opposite of flowers. So uh, Tochi is going to introduce us to uh, the dark and twisted world of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. So yeah, uh, evoking a slightly different <laughs> mind state during the, during the course of play, uh, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice uh, is a 2019 game released for uh, the PS4, Xbox One, and Windows. And it's set in a fictionalized Sengoku era Japan, and you play the shinobi who has to sort of take revenge after the kidnapping of his ward and rescue his ward. And the the specific uh, piece about this game and what makes it particularly interesting is that it's a From Software game. And when people talk about From Software, uh, that's synonymous with the Soulsborne games, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, these games whose primary marketing pitch is often their uh, absurdly punishing difficulty. Uh, there are, you know, similar to how there will be sort of, you know, supercuts of Kojima cutscenes, there will be supercuts of people rage quitting Soulsborne games. <laughs> you, you get to a particular boss and you've been fighting this boss for 16 hours straight with not even a hint of victory. At some point you smash your keyboard or you throw your controller against, this is part of the From Software experience. Um, and uh, you know, we'll show uh, a little bit uh, of, of gameplay just to sort of illustrate in particularly sanguine fashion uh, <laughs> what I mean here. So as you can see, I, I died uh, a bit more than twice. Um, one of the, the interesting things about the Soulsborne games is the, the way in which story or lore can often be treated as garnish. The particular draw of these games isn't necessarily, oh, I want to play a game that's set in Sengoku era Japan. The draw of these games is often, you know, 
I, I have a bit of a masochistic streak. I want to play a very difficult game. Um, but more than that, I want to beat a very, very, very difficult game. And, you know, there's a very, you know, it's, it's funny because Sekiro is totally different from my normal speed of game. And there's a whole backstory as to how I eventually wound up playing the game. But um, it's, it's fascinating because I think From Software has found this, this formula in having these, in having their brand essentially be these, these titanically difficult games. Um, they're games that essentially focus on the gameplay. They're games that you, wherein the, the, the primary goal is essentially mastery of the mechanics. Uh, one thing that's unique to Sekiro is the posture system. And what that entails is not only do you have to strike at enemies and not only do you have to block enemies, but you have to essentially parry them, which entails plus pressing the block button at a sort of millisecond interval right when the enemy's blow is about to land. And oftentimes, if you just block, uh, your own posture bar will start to expand. And once it expands too far, your uh, posture is broken and you're sort of stunned, leaving you wide open for all sorts of attacks. And so there's incentive to parry and deflect as much as possible as opposed to blocking. And it's not easy. <laughs> I guess is the sort of, you know, long and short of it. Uh, the, the two bosses uh, in, the, in the clip that was, that was just shown, uh, those were bosses that I was fighting on my third playthrough of the game. And so I'd already fought those bosses before. I'd already beaten those bosses before. And still, I struggled. Uh, and that, I think, is a very very good encapsulation of what a Soulsborne, what a From Software game is. You know, there is a story sort of propelling the, the, the game forward, but, you know, it's, it's a story that you can sort of, as the player, play the game without really paying any attention to. The, you know, it's only, the game is only vaguely linear. There are a number of areas that you have to explore with certain things that you have to unlock and bosses that you have to fight, but there's no real prescribed order in which you need to unlock those areas or fight those bosses. One boss that, you know, many will fight sort of mid game, you can fight as like the second boss in the game if that's your speed. Uh, and so it really, really highlights that issue of player choice, of player implication, of playing at your own speed. Uh, and that, I, that was something that I found very, very, very interesting about this game was not only that, but also the issue of, of time investment and punishment and something that I wouldn't normally sort of seek out. It wasn't the traditional, you know, sort of definition of fun in much the same way that like, you know, it took me time to get into prog metal and a lot of polyrhythmic drumming. It's not the type of thing that immediately aesthetically sort of hits that, that, you know, same sort of tuning fork that like a normal four chord progression would hit. You know, it's something that you have to sort of pay attention to. It's a taste that you, that you maybe have to acquire. And similarly with Sekiro, it felt like this sort of punishing polyrhythmic sort of always slightly keeping you off balance. But once you finally get the hang of it, it's so, it's so beautiful to experience. And I will say of all the things that I've done in life, including graduating law school, including, you know, writing novels, maybe the most difficult thing that I'd ever done in my life was beating Sekiro for the first time. Um, the demon of hatred is, and that was the second boss that was displayed, the one with the arm made completely of fire, because of course, um, I don't have words. For, for how much time and emotional energy defeating that boss took from me. Um, and yet, that was an experience that I was drawn to. It was a unique experience and something that I don't think I could have ever endured slash enjoyed in a book or in a movie or even in a piece of music. Um, I, you know, there would be moments I was like physically fatigued afterwards um, after having engaged in this form of entertainment. And that I think is one of the ways in which Sekiro is, is really a game, a game that doesn't have really cinematic aspirations. It's not terribly interested in having 
this super complex and compelling story. There are interesting bits of lore that you can seek out if you want, but it's a game about gaming, essentially. Um, and yeah, it's, I am actually getting ready for my fourth playthrough. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't played Sekiro, but um, one thing that stood out to me in that clip was the soundtrack. Like, it's like this weird Japanese noir kind of thing, right? Like that and that itself, I think I want to be in that world. That That's a really, that's a cool place to be. The settings in the From Software games, I think speak a lot to that too. And that's really cool, yeah. Yeah, it's it, one word I want to uh, underline and it's appropriate that you notice the, the music, uh, is is a word Tochi kept using, which is rhythm. Like I think it, I think that these games are are rhythm games. Like from software games, you know, we when we think rhythm game, we think like there's like Rock Band and Guitar Hero, and there's like games that are kind of music games. Um, but this is also a rhythm game. It, it requires you to really um, map the enemy's animation and understand the sound cues you're getting, and start to really like in the way that listening to jazz requires this kind of rigor, like listening for those little cues and those little changes and switches, um, those modulations in the soundtrack that are gonna, that are gonna cue your behavior in certain ways. And so I, I think it, it does require a lot of attentional resources and it requires a, a sense of rhythm that I don't know that most games do. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm gonna save a couple questions uh, that I wanted to ask to kind of debrief off of these examples, but we have really good audience questions. So I wanna to go to a few of those, if that's all right with the two of you. Are, are you, is it, okay, any parting shots before we do that? All good. Wonderful. Yeah, we're good, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Okay, so JP uh, asks, uh, does it make sense for media criticism to treat games as an homogenous block, given the vast differences uh, between story-driven and mechanically oriented single-player and multiplayer games. There seems limited comparison between something sport-like or something self-consciously film-like, like a game we didn't talk about today, Heavy Rain, for example. Uh, it seems that games are unique in their combination of elements found in storytelling media, sports, and puzzles. Does games criticism have something to learn from studies in sport or puzzle as well as in film? I think it makes sense for all of these games to be called games. I mean, I, I do think they share DNA just like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy shares DNA with Citizen Kane all the way down. Um, I, 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 I don't see any problem with that. And I don't think it, that that changes um, how we have to think of them. I, yeah, I, they, they occupy the same, the same space, um, but the, the broad, um, just wealth of experiences within video games. I think it's something to be celebrated. And I think it's, it makes the entire, the entire ecosystem, uh, you know, really rich. And that's a good thing for an art form. Yeah. No, absolutely. I second that completely. That's the tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, as someone who doesn't know a whole lot about sports or puzzles, JP, I, I would say that those are probably both really interesting things to put into dialogue with games. And uh, my wife really loves puzzle games and I don't like them. They make me feel very stupid. And um, so <laughs> she, uh, when she's, what she appreciates about games is probably a lot more similar to like puzzle design. And, and I'm always really mystified by how much game designers who are doing puzzle type games can do with just like one or two button inputs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's amazing, but it is extremely different work than putting together these other games. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I mean, just appreciating that internal diversity and um, you know, there's a new phenomenon in, in the sports and games uh, nexus now, which is called baseball. And if you haven't checked it out, you should look at it. It's this, it's this online thing that flowered up when uh, baseball was on hiatus and um, it's, basically fantasy baseball, but in a kind of de highly democratic and, and fantastical world. So like uh, players can vote on changes. There's completely fake teams and players. Um, uh, for example, like players can be voted into hell by, by uh, fans or uh, the fans voted that um, one of the weather conditions could be blood rain. So sometimes it rains blood during the games and that affects the game. But all you see is box scores, but it has all these video game mechanics in it. It's kind of a betting game, but it also allows for like, collective reshaping and negotiation over the rules of, of baseball. And um, so I, I, I think there's a lot to learn from sports and there's a whole world of sports games that we did not touch on today. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I, one thing I'd like people to come away with from this is like, 
having different ways of thinking of games as a medium and like thinking of them on their own terms, but also having fruitful comparisons and contrast with other media and not just film. Because I think we're often funneled into that film comparison. I think I've uh, benefited a lot, I think, in my thinking of, of admitting music and, and, and sort of other uh, ideas that we've talked about into the way I think about games. And uh, I think uh, an expanded language will help us be more specific about what we like and don't like and what we value and don't value. One thing that I'll be that I'd be very, very, very curious um, to see is the evolution of the ways in which we talk about and analyze multiplayer modes. Um, mm -hmm. I think that'll be absolutely fascinating if we can get beyond the nomenclature of saying whether or not uh, a particular system or mechanics works. You know, there'll mm. be you know, critics will say oh, the multiplayer mode in, in this game works or the multiplayer mode in this game is clunky, but there won't necessarily be an elaboration of that. And Jess, mm -hmm. I think what you were talking about with regards to Death Stranding in many ways ultimately being a game that connects gamers, but in this really sort of off base and asynchronous way, like that I think is fascinating. And it'll be interesting because I think that's something also that's unique to games and finding a vocabulary for that, I think is one of the more interesting challenges that awaits gaming journalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, hey, if we wanna talk about uh, sports and games, we, esports, like this is, this is a, there, there are so many sports executives and NBA executives and NFL executives in video game industry now. They're, they're building multi-million dollar uh, franchises and leagues and, and these conversations are happening on that side. Um, but yeah, from the criticism side, I think, I think um, we're getting there. And I think there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room. And I think honestly, Twitch and live streaming and YouTube, like just letting people see how the game is played, letting someone talk through their experience live playing it, it's huge. And I think that's really helped a lot for people putting their thoughts together, yeah. So uh, another question uh, dovetails nicely with something I wanted to touch on, which is the, the question, I'll, I'll just tee up mine because it's very general and then I'll ask Nathan's question. Nathan, thank you for this. But I wanted to talk about, and we've already started doing it, of what would it take to talk differently uh, about games if we thought of them as kind of a time-based medium or a medium that's primarily um, about orchestrating our emotions in a specific way. And, and, you know, is that something we should do and does it require specific moves or rethinkings of, you know, how we approach games? So Nathan's question, which is more specific, I think, and more helpful is, uh, given the highly variable lengths of games overall or in terms of individual sessions, do you have any thoughts about the immediate emotional impact versus enduring emotional impact of the medium? Mass Effect and similar games with time to get to know the characters could be on one end of this versus a 20 minute indie experience like A New Life or A Mortician's Tale uh, on the other side. You know, what, what do we think about these um, kind of huge contrasts in time investment and emotional uh, impact? I think there's a, there's a sort of dual layer that, you know, I don't wanna say has to, but can sort of be evoked in talking about these games. Um, you know, Flower, you know, I, I finished that game in a day, but it still stays with me. Like it's, I still think about it. I still think about the ways in which that game acted upon me. Um, in, a, in a different way, you know, The Last of Us 2 took up a ton of my time. And I think about that game all the time, but for very, 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 very different reasons. And one of the things that, that I wonder about is, talking about specific games on their own terms in terms of, you know, intentions and execution, but also within a broader, but also more specific gaming tradition. And so similar to how visual art will have, you know, genres and subgenres, you'll have the impressionists, you'll have the cubists, you'll have the romanticists, and you'll see all the ways in which historically they're intertwined or interconnected, which artists came from which tradition, and which, tra which tradition ended up, you know, further down the line, you know, birthing which tradition. I think that's a very fascinating sort of, that genealogical uh, framework, I think would be a fascinating, you know, application to games. You know, you could trace, for instance, like, you know, platformers, you know, from Braid to, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, the ways in which DNA is exchanged there. And I, like, I think, 
that could help us talk about games sort of on their own terms in their own sort of ecosystem while at the same time uh, getting at the just the richness of the media. There are so many games out there, like so many games out there. And it, it, it almost, it breaks the brain to talk about or to really think about how recent an invention you know, or an innovation video games are because there's, there's just so much art out there. Yeah, and in terms of like the length of time you spend with each game, I, I mean, I think a good game can create a world that sticks around with you. I mean, they could, that could be a minute, that could be a second. It doesn't need to be a long amount of time. Like you said, I think about games that, that took up a very short amount of time of my life, but have, have really stuck with me, the message has or the world has. Um, I think that's, yeah, I wonder like creating a character in a game like Fallout or something and then playing through that whole game. I mean, a lot of people will create something that looks like themselves, right? Or, or so it's like really putting yourself in there. And then there's the amount of time you have to put in there too. I think that adds to it. I think the time you spend with a character uh, or, or a world or a game can definitely like solidify a connection. But there's, there's a magic formula that, that some developers hit where you can, you can really just walk into a world and it's, it's real and it sticks with you. And, and it doesn't have to be a huge narrative feast. It can just be a slice and, uh, and it can work just as well, yeah. And, you know, just sort of taking that and braiding it with the player choice aspect of it. You know, I think a lot about Red Dead Redemption 2 and, you know, how sort of belatedly I discovered the fast travel mechanic and how ultimately it didn't matter to me because I took so much joy out of literally just riding my horse from area to area. Um, you know, whether or not it was the, the, the visual rendering of the scenery, whether or not it was just the sort of the, the way in which the pacing and the sound of my horse's hooves clopping got me into that flow state, whether it was a combination of all of these things, um, whether it was something else entirely or, you know, all of the above, that is something that I think is unique to games and can completely render elastic this sense of time investment. You know, you can, you know, try to bludgeon your way through the sort of main quest in that game, or you can, you know, spend weeks doing, you know, uh, side missions, just nothing but side missions, um, and not at all sort of advancing traditionally within the confines of the story. Um, and some, like, I think that elasticity that's caused by the player's choices, I think is, is, is something that, you know, is unique to games and something that I think, you know, merits paying attention to. So um, I want to kind of throw out a last audience question and then we'll, we'll wrap up because I think we've covered a lot of the things that I, that I was going to try to get out of my questions because you, you all have been so um, thoughtful and insightful in your answers. Um, so Catherine uh, writes that she was interested in the idea that, uh, that we were talking about, about Death Stranding making walking difficult and making you slow down because she, she hasn't played the game, but she said she, she noticed that it looked like a lot of work went into making the motion look really um, accurate, look really lifelike. Um, and uh, was, no, you know, was wondering maybe if there's a tighter than usual relationship in that game uh, between the ways the player character moves and, and the player inputs on the controller. What she's getting at in that, I think, is, is this comparative question of like the embodied experience of gameplay and how, you know, and we saw three really different examples of how you move in games and how rhythm works in games. But, you know, as another dimension, I'm reading into your question here a bit, Catherine, but that there's this other comparative dimension of like, how action and animation happens on screen in these different games and how that relates to the way that you're controlling people and, and sort of how like how that feels. I think we often say things are like tight or floaty in games or something like that. But I think the examples that we've talked about that we showed and the other ones that we've mentioned, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, I don't know if you all have thoughts about like the, the connection between your body on screen uh, or the body you're controlling on screen and like your movements or your body in the real world. I think about that in the context of sports games a lot, especially with the increasing sophistication of the game mechanics. Um, you know, it used to be you would press one button to run, you know, in a Madden game, but now you can, not only can you run, you can juke, you can, you know, do all sorts of moves to, if you're a running back, 
you know, evade defenders. Um, you know, you can press a particular button when you score a touchdown to signal a, a specific celebration. You know, you look at the NBA 2K games, there it's so complex. And it's it's interesting because pushing a button is nothing like actually shooting a jump shot. <laughs> like nothing whatsoever. But I think there's an interesting thing that games try to do in trying as much as possible to replicate the complexity of the thought process and the that sort of flow state that goes into the playing of a sport. Professional basketball players, you know, it, you know, they they will sometimes talk about how particularly when they get in their flow state, it's just their body moving. It's all sort of instinct. And I think, you know, for gamers to a certain extent, like that is that is a mind state that can get replicated, even though, you know, in terms of the actual motions, you're not doing anything similar to what your avatar is doing. But that the idea of mimicry of complexity of experience, um, I think is something that's really interesting about games. And, and that I think particularly in sports games, I've seen, uh, you know, go through this very interesting development. Yeah. Well, and speaking of genealogy, Tochi, that goes to like, there are these indie games like uh, Quop and Octodad <laughs> and I Am Bread that they try to model these really difficult ways of moving and they require these, you know, in, intense feats of hand-eye coordination and just getting around is really, really hard. And it's, you know, Quop is a game about just literally running. It's like how weird it is to have a human body and to have to move your legs. And uh, the developers are trying to sort of model out like, you know, what if you had to, uh, you know, celebrate the complexity of, of human walking on a keyboard. And it's like, well, it's really, really hard, right? And I, I think that actually though, I would speculate that that probably plays in the development of these sports games, that they're kind of like, these are all people uh, in a community, creative community kind of converging on some of the same ideas about how to use a limited set of like joysticks and buttons and keys on a keyboard to like get at exactly what you were talking about, that sort of like parallelism, that, that feeling that there is some, some similarity between the complexity of what you're doing out here and what's happening inside the screen. And, and that's exactly what gives video games their own language, right? Like I think a lot of people, especially if you grow up with video games, you can pick up a controller, you know where the jump button is, you know what to do to run, you know how to reload if it's a shooter, you know, all these things. And for, I think that's a big barrier for a lot of people getting into video games, especially if you're just starting when you're an adult or you see something that looks interesting and you want to, but you don't know how. And it's not that, it's not that scary, I promise. Like if you just j dive in and try, you'll, you'll figure it out, you really will. But I, I mean, I know I, I'm saying that as someone that has that natural language in them, you know, and, and I, I don't discount how um, intimidating that can be to have suddenly two analog sticks, one of them's walking, one of them's my vision. And that, that's really, that's a tough thing for, I mean, adults to figure out sometimes. Um, so, but I, I mean, I love when the mechanic is, is actually saying something else than the actual action that's on screen. Like in Death Stranding, yes, it's tedious and you have to be very careful to balance right and to walk right, but that's in service of slowing down, right? Of looking around. It's, it's trying to get you to do something else. You know, it's not just about being tedious. It's about, you know, the, the struggle and it's about the, the actual, um, the world that you're in and the, the vastness of it and taking time to, to look around or see, you know, the other things that uh, humans before you have left. Um, it's, I, I like that. I like when a game tricks me a little. Yeah. All right. So I think, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there much as much to my chagrin, because I would, I would love to keep talking to the two of you. So uh, thank you so much, Tochi and Jessica for joining us today. Um, each of you, where's the best place for people to find you and, and your work online? I am probably most active, more active than I should be on Twitter um, at Tochi True Story. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram at Trace64. That's T-R-E-I-Z-E-6-4. Uh, my website, tochionyebuchi.com, you know, for news, updates, uh, that sort of thing. And I think that's about it. Oh, yeah. Rebel Sisters, my latest novel, comes out in November of this year. Awesome. Um, and I follow you in all those places now too. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I'm at um, Instagram a lot, Jess L. Condit, C-O-N-D-I-T-T. -T, and then Twitter, Jess Condit, two T's. Um, and then Engadget.com. That's where you can see all my stuff. I'm on their YouTube channel a lot too. So check it out. 
Uh, and I, I, I want to thank you both again, and then also take a moment to thank my colleagues at the Center for Science and the Imagination for helping so much in making this event possible, and especially to Tyler Eglin, who is, uh, has been running our videos and keeping this Zoom session from like blowing apart at the seams. Uh, so thank you, Tyler. Uh, so keep an eye out for our next episode of CSI Skill Tree uh, next month. Uh, to get notified about episodes, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook at Imagination ASU, and visit us at csi.asu.edu. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>